what if I told you that you will not make big cuts to environmental footprint by taking shorter showers or switching off the light? And that the real impact that we have on the environment actually comes from something else. An average eight minute shower uses about 60 liters of water. And at the same time, it takes the shocking amount of 1,700 liters to produce a 100 gram chocolate bar. This is about 30 showers. And we've all been told to shower less to save water, but this is not where we use the most water. Now, we calculated that about 5% of, of household water use happens in our homes when we wash and cook. And the rest, the 95%, is hidden from us in the products that we buy. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not suggesting that you leave the water run needlessly. I'm not advocating for waste. But at the same time, we often focus our effort on activities that are not so important in terms of their environmental impact. And we tend to ignore the elephant in the room, like chocolate, among other things. So who should be made responsible for the damage of our products? Corporations, factories, certain countries? Traditionally, we make the producer responsible. I'll demonstrate. Let's take cows, for example. When cows digest grass, they release methane into the environment. When they burp, and in some other ways. And methane is a particularly strong greenhouse gas. It is about 25 times stronger a heat-trapping gas compared to carbon dioxide over a 100-year period. So overall, the livestock sector is a major contributor, contributing to 15% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And who is to blame for those emissions? Well, as I said, traditionally, we make the producer responsible. So in this case, it's the cows. <laughs> yes, we think cows should be held accountable for their actions. And even newspaper articles reflect that. <laughs> Are cows the cause of global warming? That's my favorite. Aren't we consumers sharing the responsibility through our demand of milk, meat, and cheese? Globally, when we only focus on where emissions get produced, we risk encouraging countries to simply shift their production and environmental damage elsewhere, as opposed to actually work on reducing it. And this is what's happening. Many countries that have signed international climate agreements have simply started to import the most carbon intensive products or move their facilities overseas. And while it seems like their territorial emissions are going down, the overall global emissions stay unchanged. Simply moving the dirty dishes to the other side of the sink is not going to make them clean. Many see China, the world's factory, as the bad guy because of the pollution taking place there. But if you think about it, most of the products that China produces, we buy. So in our research, we adopt a different perspective, that of consumption. And we choose to acknowledge the responsibility and the power that we consumers have. I mean, if we started to demand less products, emissions in China would also go down. We could consider buying fewer banana slicers or dog wigs, really. Fewer Twitter timeline printers, disposable cups and plates, less throwaway fashion, or toys, less stuff. We calculated that our household purchases from food to gadgets contribute to about 65% of global greenhouse gas emissions and about 80% of global water use.
That is by simply changing how we consume and what we spend our money on, we have this power to make a huge uh, difference for our planet. How do we actually calculate those impacts? We use global databases that provide us an overview of the global supply chains. Think about the phone in your pocket. What, yours doesn't look like this? <laughs> Just like a recipe book, we have a list of all the ingredients that go into the different products. And we, we know where they come from. So about your phone, that includes all the metal, glass, and plastic components, but also the energy, transportation, and labor that went into its production. And because we have an overview of the entire supply chain, we can even go a step back and see what went into the production of the truck that delivered your phone to the store. I'm hoping you're getting the feeling that the recipe gets big pretty quickly. So once we have the full recipe, we could add, the, we could add information from environmental studies in it and see what kind of emissions, water use, and other impacts took place. Using the same method, we can calculate footprints of entire nations. Do you want to see what the world looks like from consumption perspective? There it is. <laughs> Here, the size of countries is adjusted to their share of global greenhouse gas emissions. Look at how tiny Africa gets, while Europe, the US, and parts of Asia get bigger. Now, this map doesn't take into account the population. A lot of people live in China and India, so of course they contribute to a lot of pollution. If we only focus on the emissions per capita, we see that an average Chinese actually contributes to only half of the world average emissions, and about 10% of what an average American contributes to. The US, Luxembourg, Australia, Canada, these are all high emitting countries. And there's a common factor among them. They're all wealthy. Wealth is a big driver for environmental damage. And that's quite logical, right? The more money you have, the more you're able to consume. But how do we transform this link between wealth and damage? This summer, I visited a replica of a small Native American village in California, where the Yurok people used to live, and many still do today. The Yurok had no central government, but they had laws that governed interactions between individuals. And violations of those laws resulted in transfers of wealth. So one couldn't break the law and remain wealthy. This led to a natural association between wealth and virtue, with the wealthiest people in each village usually being the most virtuous ones. In the context of consumption today, wealth doesn't have to be associated with damage. It could be associated with virtue. If we learn to consume in a way that is considerate of the social and environmental consequences of our consumption, Our current culture of consumerism is entirely unsustainable, and it encourages us to live beyond our planet's limits. And it's needless to say that consuming less or differently is an unpopular concept. But our research shows that doing so could greatly reduce the damage that we're causing to our environment. So what can we do as consumers? Let's say you're in the store to buy a sofa. We can ask ourselves, do I actually need this sofa? We could be considerate and curious about the effect that it has on other beings and on the environment. And if we do need a sofa, can we buy it used? Can we buy it a better quality so it lasts longer? Our decisions to consume less matter they translate into lower demand. 
And even small changes cause ripples to spread, making a positive difference beyond our own lifestyles. And I know that it can be hard changing old lifestyles, but we could all just do our best. Mindful consumption is not about regretting the past or worrying about the future. It is about making a difference in the present and being appreciative of how beautiful our world actually is. So what would it be? Mindful consumption or consumption as usual? The choice is ours. Thank you. <laughs>